My name is Leon Dash. I'm a uh, professor in the Center for Advanced Study, and I was called on at the last minute to introduce David because the person who had been scheduled to do it is unable to do it, okay? Um, but it's my pleasure to, interview, in, uh, to introduce David Rodiger. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Center for Advanced Study special presentation by David Rodiger, Hope in History, Past and Present Burdens of Race. I would like to acknowledge and thank the co-sponsors for this talk, the Department of African American Studies, uh, the Department of History, and the Spurlock Museum. Uh, Dave is the Kendrick C. Babcock Professor of History at the University of Illinois. His research interests include race and class in the United States and the history of US radicalism. Prior to his arrival at our university in 2000, he was professor of history and chair of the American Studies program at the University of Minnesota. He received his doctorate from Northwestern University and is the author of numerous books, including, including Colored White, Transcending the Racial Past, published in 2002, Walking, I'm sorry, Working Toward Whiteness, How America's Immigrants Became White, published in 2006, and most recently, How Race Survived U.S. History, From Settlement and Slavery to the Obama Phenomenon, published this past August. The Center for Advanced Study first invited Dave to give a talk on this most recent book for, for a date in October, which is to say before the presidential election. Dave's polite, polite response was, I'd better say no. The Obama in my book, my book subtitle has me going everywhere. London and Copenhagen this week, or next week. <laughs> this was not surprising. The Obama phenomenon truly was phenomenal. And it is not an exaggeration to say the entire world was watching. Now that the election is over and President Obama installed in the White House, we are delighted that Dave can now spare some time to discuss his most recent work. His talk still remains timely, even though so many of us celebrated the election of the first non-white president of the United States. Issues of race certainly haven't disappeared from the American landscape. Please join me in welcoming Professor David Rodiger, who will talk to us about hope and history, past and present burdens of race. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Um, I have a cold, and it, uh, but everything's going to be fine. I just did, basil Thai just made the hottest soup imaginable, and I think I'm OK. Um, I want to thank Masumi uh, Liesel, uh, Jack Davis, uh, for the, uh, getting really interested in the graphic and doing a really nice uh, poster. I think I want to thank Brian uh, and the other people who are working uh, in the booth, and I want to thank Leon for the introduction. It's great to see uh, lots of old friends, uh, including Jim Oakes, who you should all go out and hear tomorrow, uh, speaking as one of our uh, Lincoln uh, lecturers. Uh, it's going to make me feel worse about my Lincoln material in this lecture, but still, I'm delighted to see Jim uh, here. Leon mentioned that I turned down this talk in October and it was partly because I was busy, but it was also partly because uh, I was a little, um, well, you'll see as I speak that Obama kind of took over my book in a, in a way. I was writing a book that was about something else and that turned out to be sharper because of being able to consider Obama at the end of the day. But 3% of the book is about Obama, and 97% of the book is about kind of the what one of my kids calls the Wayback Machine of uh, things I usually talk about, kind of history uh, purely. And so uh, I was a little bit worried about trying to cope with that disjuncture of writing a historical book and getting asked almost all contemporary uh, questions. Not that I didn't want to answer them, but that I wasn't particularly uh, qualified to answer them. And there was a little bit more of a problem. And the, the further problem was that, um, is that um, I think, in a way, we're all thinking a lot these days about hope and history. 
and how much we get to hope and how much the burden of the past still, as a great man once said, weighs like a nightmare on the, on the present. Um, and, and, but I was thinking about it in a very different way for very peculiar reasons as I finished this, this, uh, this book. And in speaking then about Obama, I f- was feeling the need and feel the need to kind of say, we need to temper hope. Or at least that's how I was thinking about it until I really started working hard on, on this talk. And now I think maybe better things can be said that we don't know so much need to temper hope or scale back hope as we need to focus and ground hope and figure out what it is we really want to place our, our hopes in. But I do kind of have that worry that it's um, an insufficiently hopeful uh, talk. Uh, and, you know, I, it's complicated in my particular case because I'm not a person who thinks that at the end of the day that the Democratic Party will have solutions to any of the problems that really press on us uh, as, a, as a people. So, uh, you know, I, there is a kind of a, a scaling back that's a part of this, but I also want to say, and maybe I have to say, that I celebrated, uh, I uh, think that the changes registered in Obama's victory and in the end of the Reagan and Bush's era are certainly something that we need to, to place hope in, but we also need to figure out where we're going to go from there. I'm tempted then in defensively talking about hope and history together to recall the sometimes wonderful Italian Marxist philosopher Antonio Gramsci's call for opti- what he called optimism of the will or spirit and pessimism of the intellect, or as uh, my mom kind of puts it, hope for the best but prepare for the, for the worst. Uh, and I think that that's a, uh, one useful framing, but it still has us putting history against hope or the burdens of the past against hope. And so one of the things that I'm trying to inch toward in some of the comments in uh, this presentation is to not make, those, make history and hope opposites of each other, but make them kind of parts of the same uh, conversation. A little more then about the talk uh, generally. First of all, it, by my standards, it's a relatively long talk. Not by Naomi Klein's standards, if any of you were at my <laughs> friend Naomi's talk. But uh, you know, I'm probably going to talk about 20 minutes about the book and current events. And then I'm going to talk for about 30 minutes about history. So it's a, a relatively uh, long talk. So after the discussion of the book and the, and the present, I'll dip back into three sections uh, on history, uh, mostly drawing on uh, how race survived uh, U.S. history. One section on the origins of race and how those origins do predict its eventual end. Another section on the mistake of grounding hope in the U.S. nation and on the ways in which the U.S. nation was supposedly founded and the inexorable tendencies toward emancipation growing out, supposedly, of that founding. And, sorry, uh, a third section on Abraham Lincoln's back and forth motions on slavery to underline C.L.R. James's point that's on the flyer for this talk uh, when James said that leaders make history, but only such history as it is possible for them to make. And so by talking about uh, that wisdom from James, I think we can get a sense of where, other than leaders, we might ground our, our hopes. So a little bit then about the book, uh, at least briefly, very briefly, um, and particularly about the ways in which I was forced to um, think about the Obama phenomenon in particular ways as I finished this book. I decided about three years ago, and, I, and parts of the beginning of this project were under a CAS grant, so I'm delighted to, to say that, um, to write a book that was um, hopelessly, ridiculously ambitious. It was, gonna, uh, it was supposed to, the contract called for, a book on, all, on race in all of U.S. history from start to now uh, with um, not just black-white racial axes uh, considered, but a multiracial nation, and it was supposed to be 100 pages or less. 
This was a crazy Oxford idea that the bigger the topic and the uh, little are the pages that you could then get them up by the cash register in bookstores and people would buy them on their way out like gum or, or, or something. Um, and I, the way I bought into the uh, idea was the editor said, there are hundreds of thousands of people in the United States who are willing to spend two hours trying to figure out race, but not five. <laughs> and uh, as I actually tried to write the book, and as that editor moved on from Oxford, it turned out that I couldn't do it in 100 pages. It's about a 200, a little more than 200 page book. And so it's, I'm hoping that there are people who are willing to spend three hours and 15 minutes trying to figure out race, uh, but, not, but not five. Um, but the, the way that I then chose to organize the book in order to make some coherence out of this uh, wildly ambitious uh, topic was to try to think about all of the different ways that we hear, popularly mostly, that, and sometimes from scholars, that race is almost over in the United States. It's either over or it's, or it's almost over. And in fact, that the only problem is that people still keep talking about racism and that, that's what creates the, the, uh, the bitterness around race, not oppression. Um, and so every chapter of the book was meant to be organized around a big idea in US history that's existed for a long time that we could say that ought to have eroded race thinking and white supremacy in the United States. So after a chapter on how we got race in the first place, uh, how is it that a nation with a declaration of independence still ends up being a white supremacist nation? How is it that a nation that has an Emancipation Proclamation still ends up being a white supremacist nation? And, and all this phenomenal change in the 1860s and 1870s. How is it that a nation, that another chapter, that has more or less open mass immigration from Europe of people, peoples, nationalities, who are considered to be of different races and might have created divisions inside the so-called white race or inside uh, the European population. How is it that at the end of that long process, those peoples kind of get to join white America rather than challenge white America and don't erode uh, the concept of, of race thinking? And then uh, an unexpected chapter on how race survived capitalism, because I found so many right-wing uh, thinkers arguing that capitalism is a raceless system that all capitalists care about is labor inputs and efficiency and productivity and therefore uh, we should expect them, the market, will do the work of anti-racism for us. So there's a, a chapter on that and then a final chapter, there was meant to be a final chapter on how race survived uh, the New Deal and the civil rights revolution of the 1960s and the early um, 70s. So very practical stuff, and it, as I was conceptualizing the project, the Supreme Court decision on affirmative action came down, and in it, uh, Justice O'Connor, in delivering the justification, the swing vote, for the little preservation of one corner of affirmative action that's still legal in uh, universities, O'Connor said, um, we, we allow this, I allow this really, it was her vote that decided it, uh, but with the understanding that really in 25 years we won't need this anymore, that there are these big processes that are getting rid of race for us and we just need to let that register and let it happen. So the whole book was designed to call that into question in a long historical frame and say, no, there's always been things that tend to undermine race thinking and they've never undermined race thinking. So to try to to ask why that's, um, why that's the case. So the, the book begins, I, I sample it a little bit, with a uh, litany of statistics that are directed against people right and left, mostly right, who are saying that race is disappearing. And these statistics are from various times, but all in the recent past. Black males born in 1991, 27 years after the most important modern civil rights acts, are estimated to have a 29% chance of imprisonment 
more than seven times that of whites born in the same years. Latino men are incarcerated at four times the white male rate, and half of those incarcerations are for drug crimes, which are interracial, which are uh, committed actually a little more by uh, white offenders than people of color. In 2004, way more than two centuries after the Declaration of Independence found all men to have been created equal, blacks and Latinos suffered poverty at rates three times that of the white uh, majority population. Nearly three in 10 children of color lived in poverty as against one in 10 white children. In 2006, 52 years after Brown versus Board had proclaimed segregated educational establishments to be unequal, Black students constituted 2.2% of the entering first year students at, U at University of California at Los Angeles. Of the very few that were admitted, one fifth were scholarship athletes. At the time of writing this book, reports show that in 2008, two thirds of all African American and Latino urban students are in schools where less than 10% of the students are white. One black student in six and one Latino student in nine attend what Gary Orfield in a Harvard Civil Rights Project report calls apartheid schools, schools that are less than 1% white. In 2003, 79 years after the Indian Citizenship Act was passed, joblessness among Native Americans tripled that of whites. In 1998, as the United States celebrated the 135th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation, the net worth of African Americans and Hispanic families was 17% that of non-Hispanic whites. And I kind of often, in talking to students as I was writing this book and, and I, I was giving talks uh, in various places, I'd say, look, people are predicting that race is going to disappear. It's been around for 300 years. White families are seven times more wealthy than African American families. Black young men are seven times more likely to go to jail than white young men. How, in the face of those material facts, is race going to disappear? And actually, now those facts are worse. With the housing uh, uh, failures, the differential in wealth is about one to nine now, rather than, than one uh, to seven. As I write these words, wrote these words, 75% of all active tuberculosis cases in the United States afflict people of color. As Illinois prepares to celebrate a bicentennial of African-American emancipation around the bicentennial of Abraham Lincoln's birth, a majority of its HIV AIDS cases occur among African-Americans. So the diseases of the poor are the diseases of poor people of color. And Ruthie Gilmore's uh, great work from Out of Geography in which she tries to define racism as the capacity to, ha to hand out premature death to certain groups of people is just powerfully borne out by these kinds of social, social facts. And so I was kind of trying to, to say, look, race is not about to disappear. And then the primaries came along. And if you'll remember the primaries, every other week, if you picked up the newspaper, race was disappearing. <laughs> then in the alternate weeks, it was the only thing that, that mattered. But every other week, it was, it was disappearing. So when... Um, Obama won the caucuses in Iowa. Uh, the Wall Street Journal, before anybody else, immediately crowed that, well, nobody needs to draw an equal sign between the United States and racism anymore because this proves that we've gotten over race. Then it looked like the next primaries that in whitest New Hampshire, Obama was going to do so well as to knock Hillary Clinton out of the race. And in a swing of about 18 percentage points between the last polls and the actual voting, Clinton wins the primary. All the editorials that day are about how, well, this is all about race. This is, so so I, I was trying literally to finish a book that was about the disappearance of race. And from hour to hour, people were deciding that either race was gone or it, was, it wasn't moving at all. Um, and if you just uh, think about the, the elections, uh, the primaries and, and the elections a little bit, um, Hillary Clinton's awful appeal, we know it's awful because she then immediately denounced it as being awful herself, her appeal to um, 
working Americans, hardworking Americans, white Americans. Um, where voters of color were concerned, the attempts to find a simplistically racial explanation for voting choices ran riot. Uh, one Clinton advisor, uh, Hispanic advisor to Clinton's campaign, told the New Yorker that, quote, the Hispanic voter, and I want to say this very carefully, has not shown a lot of willingness to support black candidates. And, end quote. and in doing so, he was echoing and forwarding all kinds of superficial reporting on a supposed black Latino rift that was so deep as to be uh, unbridgeable. Uh, and criticisms of this stance centered on, its po on political correctness, not on the fact that it was completely historically wrong, that you could find all kinds of explanations of successful black Latino uh, all kinds of examples of successful black Latino uh, coalitions. Then when Obama uh, trounced McCain in the polls among Latino voters, nobody felt any need to apologize and say, oh, actually we didn't know anything uh, about that. Uh, more spectacularly, although it's now hard to recall, see if you remember this, um, pundits originally tied very early polls showing African American preferences for Clinton over Obama in the earliest stages of the pre-primary campaign, to the, the idea that blacks were voting atavistically uh, against Obama because he was not black enough, culturally, and perhaps genetically. When massive black support for Obama did coalesce, especially in the South Carolina primary, the equally reductive explanation, forwarded by Bill Clinton, uh, became that African Americans vote along racial lines. So no matter how black voters voted, they were going to be typed as voting uh, irrationally and racially uh, rather than out of a political uh, commitment. So I, I had to finish the book in March, and literally I had to figure out who was going to win. <laughs> and I just decided that I somehow knew that Obama was going to win the nomination and win the the general election, and particularly when I went to give some talks abroad, uh, I get all kinds of uh, letters now about what a great prognosticator I am. I, I just felt like I had to say, I had to finish somehow, and so I had to try to think what, I, what was gonna, gonna happen. But um, after the, and during the campaign, I ended up writing maybe a couple dozen interviews or uh, op-ed pieces, and I want to just sample one part of one before we get back into the history um, parts. And I became very attracted to um, a line from Malcolm X in, in which uh, Malcolm says racism, white supremacy, uh, is like a Cadillac in the United States, and his, his payoff for the line was that, that uh, there's always a, some kind of change every model year, but if you look at them all from year to year to year, they're all Cadillacs, and you can kind of see how they're all Cadillacs. And so I was attracted to it because it particularly um, makes you think in that formulation, it's very supple, it makes you think about what's the same, but it also does make you think that things change. Things aren't just the same. Um, so here's, I think, probably from Counterpunch or from Z, a, a three or four paragraphs, trying to come to grips with what might have changed uh, in the election. To think more precisely about uh, the coexistence in the United States of such stark and deadly racial inequalities with the historical triumph of an African-American presidential candidate requires us to recognize that racism is more than one thing and to specify what has changed, how the Cadillac's different. The view that Obama heralds the end of race thinking in the U.S. rests on a particular definition of racism, one that currently holds much sway and I think dominance in U.S. politics and popular culture. Racism turns on this view on the bad but disappearing individual attitudes of whites. Um, attitudes of the sort that can be measured by whether many or few voters act on those attitudes on election day, or even by the ratings among whites of Oprah Winfrey's television shows or the sales of products that Tiger Woods uh, endorses. So that's one way to talk about the end of race and the end of racism. And it's a way that doesn't necessarily have to engage the deep structural 
inequalities that I led off with here today. And indeed, though those structural inequalities may be considered unfortunate, on this dominant view, race is personal. It's not structural, it's personal, and if we can just get people to behave better, uh, then uh, we've done something, and we have done something. It's better that people behave better than that they behave worse. It doesn't change structural uh, realities necessarily. The election results do measure a growth of more liberal personal racial attitudes among whites, though with some complexities. Overwhelming majorities among, and high turnouts among black and Latino voters, 40% of all new voters came from those populations, turned the election in Obama's favor. McCain won the white vote, but barely, with Obama slightly outpolling the 2004 Democratic candidate, John Kerry, among whites. Interestingly, the polls also show that some of that success did not co coincide at all with racial tolerance, with one poll showing Obama getting 20% of the votes from whites who on other responses were staunch racist, but who were savvy enough to realize that it wasn't in their interest to have four more years of Republican rule uh, on the economy or on other issues. Disasters abroad and economic collapses at home ensured that no votes were simply and only racial votes. Even so, the election of Obama expressed monumental change among white voters in two ways. First, the Republican nods, winks, and more open appeals to white voters along racial lines did not work this time around. The desperate attempts to connect the subprime mortgage crisis to alleged favoritism to minority borrowers proved too ridiculous to fly, although if you watch Fox News, they're still trying to get that up in the, in the air. The insistent efforts to brand Obama as not one of us, playing on his name and his alleged sympathy for Islam, fell equally flat. Uh, my friend Pedro Caban, uh, who used to teach here, I was on a panel with him not long ago in New York, he said, and this was June before the election, he said something that was fascinating, I thought. He, he said that he thought up to that point, Obama had been more attacked as an immigrant than he'd been attacked using the tropes of anti-black racism. So it was like, oh, what a funny name. Oh, uh, declare, you, what, what's your religion anyway? And where's your flag pin? Those were the three Republican uh, attacks at that uh, point uh, in the campaign. Uh, secondly, white young people not only voted in great numbers for Obama, but swelled the energy and numbers of his crowds. Any analysis which responds to the everything has changed extravagances of the Wall Street Journal by sourly holding that nothing has changed regarding race is therefore partial and wrong. Obama's candidacy embodied and expressed much of what has challenged white supremacy since the 1960s, and is part of what my book is about. Immigration by people of color, significant increases in racial intermarriage and transracial adoptions, and the rise of a cosmopolitan, successful new black middle class, uh, and the critically important fact that for a half a century now, African American social movements have best symbolized for the nation the possibility of change, a theme which would become Obama's uh, watchword. I would add that the tremendous influence of African and Latino popular culture, usually in the most highly marketed forms, leaves race seeming more and more to young people, especially a matter of choice and even taste. And when you, talk, when you heard young black voters expressing their preference or being parts of these crowds that followed Obama, very often it was conditioned. Jabari Asim's book kind of gives us some sense of, of how this uh, might be true. It was conditioned by these other choices that young uh, white people had made in being attracted to African-American heroes and to African-American culture. However, to chart such changes is also to note their limitations. Race is not a matter of choice for most poor people of color in the United States, who are often illegal in terms of immigration status, are in the system in terms of incarceration and its aftermath. Moreover, the politics of style which attracted young white voters to Obama would have been greatly strained if his campaign had also included straightforward plans to redress racial inequalities. The resonances of freedom movements by people of color inspired the Obama campaign, but those movements are themselves in considerable disarray. The election therefore told us critical, but by no means simple things about the present and, pre the, present and the future of race um, in the United States. So I led with the present, and I uh, 
in claiming the right to then talk about history for 25 minutes. Um, and I, I want to talk first of all about the origins of race in the United States and how the, the story of those origins might give us both hope and caution. Um, the greatest U.S. historian yet, uh, W.B. Du Bois, uh, captured in an essay during World War I how uneasily modern racism sits in the longer run of world history in, in Du Bois. And by the way, a lot of what I'm going to be quoting from Baldwin and from Du Bois and from C.L.R. James and, and others is in popular writing. And I think it's very interesting how the most lasting insights about race in the United States are actually produced in popular and often political uh, writing. So Du Bois is writing a short, more or less popularly styled, uh, he hoped, uh, article in, I think, 1916. And he says, quote, the discovery of personal whiteness among the world's peoples is a very modern thing. He adds, the ancient world would have laughed at such a distinction. And in the Middle Ages, skin color would have provoked nothing more than mild curiosity, end quote. Uh, Eugene Genovese would later kind of say this same thing by saying a loose body of prejudices and superstitions became, at a certain point in history, a virulent moral disorder uh, in a deep structural context. So white supremacy, race thinking even, is this little corner of world history. And Du Bois said that because he not only wanted to say that that, that kind of behavior and thought had a beginning, but if it did, it had an end. This was Elijah Muhammad's point, too, that there's a beginning to white supremacy. There's also going to be an end uh, to, to white supremacy. Um, and that very modern thing is kind of Paul Gilroy and what this, these connections of Du Bois was connecting modernism, the modern, with the slave trade and with the origins of, uh, of race uh, in the world. And then he goes into a little bit of math, and he says, uh, it's certainly not more than about 250 years old. And then, if you do your math, you get back to the latter part of the 1600s for the U.S., what's going to become the U.S. Uh, example. So what happened then? Well, what happened is that between 1660 and 1680, in tobacco production in Virginia and Maryland, there was one titanic rebellion after another among poor people and producers of tobacco. In the greatest of those rebellions, in Bacon's Rebellion in uh, 1676, the rebellion rose to the level of civil war. And that rebellion, and almost all of those rebellions, were interracial rebellions. There wasn't white. There wasn't black. There were all sorts of different distinctions among peoples who were more, uh, with Africans being more often, but by no means always enslaved, and whites being more often uh, indentured. But poor white people and poor black people were people who hung out together, swapped rhythms, swapped culture, loved each other, married each other, and most troublesome, rebelled and ran away with each other. And it's a very important social fact because it means that race didn't, slavery didn't grow out of bad attitudes. The people didn't just have bad attitudes and therefore say, adopt slavery. In fact, the opposite was true as we look at it. The, the, the social fact was that people were willing to embrace each other. And that's what had to be put a stop to in order to create a stable uh, agrarian economy uh, in the tobacco regions. So it's in the wake of Bacon's Rebellion that you begin to get uh, laws passed that make sharp distinctions between Africans and Europeans and that forbid their love, and forbid their intermarriage, and that punish 
their children, and particularly uh, the children of, of black women with a, a white father, slave women with a, a, a white father, uh, by making, uh, by gendering the system so that uh, the mother's status, you know, just picked out of the air. No, no other inheritance works that way in the colonies. That the mother's status is going to, uh, so the, the, the social fact that is created is that white women give birth to freedom, oppressed as they are, and black women give birth to slavery. But that's not because of a world of bad attitudes that always existed. It's created as an alternative to the attitudes that in fact existed. And if you, if you think um, even the other wholesale change in the wake of Bacon's Rebellion is to use an overwhelmingly enslaved African labor force. There were beginning to be slaves before Bacon's Rebellion, but not as a significant factor in production. All of a sudden, in the next 30 years, you get this huge increase in African slavery. C.L.R. James points out that that also is, of course, creating racism. It's a, it's a decisive moment in the creation of, of racism and, and white supremacy and the associations of whiteness and, and property uh, in US history. But it doesn't grow out of bad racial attitudes. To invest all of your capital in an African labor force is, James points out, to express confidence in the excellence of that labor force, not in its inferiority. And in many cases, we know that specific African skills, either with crops or uh, with iron uh, or with fishing, were sought. And specific African ethnicities were being bought for specific purposes. So this wasn't about, and, and neither did anybody labor under the illusion that uh, until very much later, that black people didn't want freedom. People were clear right through the revolution and after that of course slaves wanted freedom, of course Africans wanted freedom. It took a long time for all those bad intellectual habits and attitudes to get created. They didn't exist naturally. So we should be very, very uh, hopeful that the longer run of world history is in fact against, that, that white supremacy is an inhuman behavior, not only in its inhumanity, uh, in its brutality, but also it doesn't come with being human. In fact, kind of historically the opposite has come with being human. I, I just say one more thing about this and then uh, I want to make a point about Bacon's Rebellion and Indians. Um, I just uh, have been very taken with this history of painting and race. And uh, one of the things that it points out is that in high European art, it was very, very late before white elite men were painted as being white, the color white. They were painted until deep into the 17th century, whatever color that white people actually are, they were painted that. And then, all of a sudden, about the time that Du Bois says personal whiteness was discovered, you begin to get these paintings of these hyper-white uh, people. And this book kind of says, without following up very much, the first person to be painted as white, so white as to almost be translucent, was John Locke. So that John Locke, the great pro-slavery, pro-conquest philosopher and colonial bureaucrat, was the first white person in European, in European art. You know, could just be Locke. But uh, I think maybe it's, it's, it's also something that's, that's worth thinking about because white becomes a noun in the context of conquest and the turn to mass slavery and, and racial division as a form of social control. People didn't talk, Toni Morrison's great new uh, A Mercy book uh, has uh, people of color talking about whites as Europe's. Uh, the, the characters in that book that just came out called, called whites, Europe's, and uh, you know, the, the term white was an exotic word as a noun right up until the 1680s or the, or the 1690s. It had to be uh, created. But then the other sobering point about the creation of race 
is that that wonderful civil war that was mounted by the black and white uh, poor in uh, colonial Virginia uh, was directed against native people. And so the demand was faster and bloodier expansion onto native land so that these people coming out of indentured servitude wanted to be able to own their own land. And so interracially, they bought into this idea that it was, uh, that the best way to do that was to pursue a more aggressive anti-Indian uh, policy. And I think again and again in the book, and I'll maybe only hit this point glancingly today, but again and again, one of the reasons that race survives is that it's so many different things. That it has its moments in which its anti, uh, its imperial racism is the most important uh, dimension. It has its most frequent moments when anti-black racism is its leading edge. It also grows out of settler colonialism. It grows out of anti-immigrant sentiment. So it's very, very labile and able to make its, its uh, adjustment. I want to then just uh, talk briefly about the, uh, the nation and race. Um, when Obama uh, gave the most important, the first, most imp the first important race speech of his campaign, he got as close to the Declaration of Independence as he could be in order to do it. It was a Philadelphia speech. And he said something that was very brave and then kind of took some of it back. And he said, uh, he pointed out that the founding fathers were slaveholders. And then he said, but the document that they produced also held in it the seeds of everything that would get rid of this system. So he kind of put out there this American exceptionalist view that from the Declaration forward, we get this commitment to freedom that was a dilemma, that was imperfect, that was gradual, but it was going to unfold toward freedom. And I think that, you know, as a, as a way to make political arguments, that's fine. It's not true as an analysis of the Declaration of Independence or of Jefferson. Uh, and so we need to figure out if change doesn't come through great documents, where does it come from. Uh, the Declaration of Independence uh, has a very famous stricken passage that Jefferson writes about slavery and then withdraws. And uh, in the course of the campaign, in all of this races over rhetoric, very often you'd hear people say Jefferson wanted to abolish slavery in the Declaration, but he was forced not to. It's easily available online, you should look at it. Jefferson did no such thing, even in the draft that he withdrew. What he said was, slavery is a regrettable consequence of British misbehavior, that the crown dumped these slaves on us and now we're uh, stuck with them. And he denounced uh, the slave trade in the most crusading moral uh, language. But then he said, and now the crown is trying to encourage slave rebellions. And what did he call those re rebellions? He called them crime and he called them murder. So this document that's all about the natural rights of humans to rebel and seize their freedom, then turns to slaves and says, yeah, when they do that, that's murder. That's, cr that's criminality. It's not a document that toys with the idea that these natural rights apply across the board. Uh, it, and, I mean, Jefferson had to withdraw even that in deference to unity with white, uh, with northern slave traders and with far southern uh, plantation owners. And it also ignored is that the Declaration says um, he, the crown, has excited uh, domestic insurrections among us and has endeavored, the domestic insurrection is struck eventually, he has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers the merciless Indian savages whose known rule of warfare is an un, 
distinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions of existence. And that set the ground rules for the massacres of Indians during the actual uh, Revolutionary War. So I mean, I think we use founding documents for whatever purpose we can use them, but we shouldn't be under any illusion that the nation as a form in the United States was founded out of something other than white supremacy and, and empire. And we get to see it kind of clearly in Jefferson's case because he actually gets to be president. And he gets to be president because the Constitution writes advantages in appropriation uh, in, uh, in votes for uh, slaveholders. So they get to count their slaves as three-fifths of, uh, of a person. Doesn't do the slaves any good, it does the slaveholders good, and it gets a, Je Jefferson elected in 1800. So what does he do when he's president? He buys Louisiana. And we think of, and here again, race is more than one thing, we think of the purchase of the Louisiana, the Trans-Mississippi West, as being about Indian history. And it was that, and it was about then the conquest of that uh, area and the pushing of people from one side of the Mississippi to the other. Uh, but it was also a new lease on life for slavery. When Jefferson bought Louisiana, there were 900,000 slaves in the United States. At the time of the Civil War, there were four million slaves in the United States. And it was the political economy of being able to open these new areas to slave agriculture and to let areas that were failing in some ways, like Jefferson's uh, plantation, export slaves to those areas that makes uh, that expansion from 900. More people were slave traded inside the United States by far in the early 19th century than were victims of the transatlantic slave trade in the whole colonial period, if you're talking about British uh, North America. So you get this, Jefferson also says at one point, uh, I could almost bracket the labor of my free female slaves. I could almost just not care about that at all because their reproduction, all of this is deeply gendered at every turn, their reproduction makes me so much money. He didn't bracket their labor. He did actually try to figure out how to use their labor most efficiently. But he says, I could do that. So, you know, I mean, more is involved here structurally and deeply than just Jefferson's attitudes and the fact that he had these good attitudes but couldn't quite either be a profile in courage and fight for them or he couldn't get enough political agreement to go along with these good attitudes. When he talked about those slave women as producing his wealth through children, he was talking partly about his own enslaved children as part of his, his wealth. So that those children became a basis for his political power in the way that things were apportioned and then also became uh, a, a basis for his wealth. I want to talk uh, lastly about Lincoln and uh, briefly. I want to talk about two Lincoln court cases and then show you a wonderful, wonderful painting and think about what happened in Lincoln's life that made it possible for he, him to become the great emancipator. The first court case, both of them are from right around here, so local history. Uh, the first is from 1847 and it's a case that takes place down in Charleston where Eastern Illinois University is in Coles County. And in this case, now Lincoln you'll know from, I think, living in Illinois, since 1841 when he on a steamboat had seen a coffle of slaves uh, tethered together, had written, uh, or later wrote, that that was his sea change and he realized that if he could ever strike a blow against slavery, he was going to strike a blow uh, against slavery. Um, 1847, in Charleston, there's a, a farmer, has a farm in Kentucky and a farm in Coles County, and he's bringing his slaves up from the Kentucky farm and working them during the agricultural season in the Charleston area 
on a farm and then returning them to Kentucky every year and saying, oh, well, these aren't people being enslaved in Illinois, they're just in transit. The transit happens to be always when agricultural work has to be performed. They're, they're there in Illinois to, to do that work. A local doctor who's an abolitionist shelters five of the slaves and uh, goes to court to argue that by virtue of coming into a free state, those slaves are free. And Lincoln signs on his counsel to the side of the case that wants to return the slaves to Kentucky, and by this time the threat is to actually sell them to the horrors of Alabama or, or, or Mississippi. He then is approached by this abolitionist doctor, and he says, oh yeah, I probably got the wrong side here. So he goes back to his client and says, I'd like to change my mind about this. And the, the, out of a welter of confusion, he ends up not having a place on either side. He's alienated both sides. He then says, well, but I'm here in Charleston, and I'd really like to make money out of this. So he goes back to the slaveholder and says, please let me take this, this case. And he fights to return these slaves south. That's 1847. It's not all of Lincoln. There's also cases that are egalitarian in Lincoln's legal practice. Very few cases hinging on race, but that's, that, that's one of them. The more interesting one for me is in 1855, and it's even closer to here. It's in uh, Farmer City. The courthouse is in Clinton. And uh, in this particular case, it's written about by a former student here named Stacy McDermott, uh, about to be written about. A Tennessean named William Dungy moves up to Farmer City in 1851, marries into a prominent family, acquires land, and makes angry his brothers-in-law and maybe his father-in-law. So in their anger, they begin going around the Farmer City area and saying, actually, William Dungy is black. Actually, William Dungy uh, is posing as a white person, but we can, we can produce witnesses from Tennessee who think that he's probably black. Dungy goes to Lincoln and says, I want you to represent me in a libel case because these people are calling me black. And Lincoln understands the logic of it right away, and he's great in court. He says, uh, look, in Illinois, it's really valuable to be white. You get to marry. This, his, uh, Dungy's marriage would have been called into question if he would have been found to be black. You get to own land and make deals, and people don't say, oh, I don't want to live next to you or farm next to you. You get all these things, and you're legally entitled to stay in the state, which is, a, given Illinois' black laws, it's even a question of, of residency at this, at this point. So Lincoln goes to, to court and says, not only is this wrong, he claims Dungy's actually Portuguese. He says, I don't, I don't know if he's white, but he's Portuguese. He's definitely not, not black. Uh, and, and he says, not only is this wrong in terms of fact, but it's damaging. It's a libel that matters. And so he asked for $1,000, which is about three years of wages for an average worker at that time in this, in this case. And he wins. He immediately tells his client to give most of the money back to the people who the judgment was against in order to keep an appeal from happening because Lincoln thinks he's going to uh, lose the case on appeal. And then Dungy moves down to farther southern Illinois, to Benton, and uh, names his next kid Abraham Lincoln. His wife goes with him. Now, that to me is a really interesting case because so much of the Lincoln debates try to figure out, oh, was Lincoln on the side of the angels or wasn't he on the side of the angels? Was he, in terms of his attitudes, was he racist or was he not racist? In this case, there's no side of the angels. There's not that, I mean, I guess we would say, oh, I hope I was on Lincoln's 
I would have taken Lincoln's position, I would have argued against the race baiting brother-in-laws. But in order to make that argument, you had to say white people get certain rights, white people are entitled to certain things, and therefore um, that's how the, the world ought to work. So there really wasn't a productive anti-racist uh, position to be argued there. Now, I don't want to say that, that Lincoln's politics didn't work great racial change, but they didn't do so by being either consistently anti-racist or pro-abolitionist. They were firmly against the expansion of slavery into new territories, and that was plenty to anger the South and to provoke uh, division North and South, but it wasn't plenty to lead to the expectation that Lincoln was going to become this world-shaking figure as a great emancipator. So if we could get the slide up, uh, I'll conclude by talking a little bit about this great painting and, and we can take a few questions. So even the war doesn't automatically propel Lincoln towards an emancipatory position. And if, if you're walking around on campus and, and you're uh, in Lincoln Hall or around Lincoln Hall, Lincoln quotes ring Lincoln Hall. And if you look on the edge of Lincoln Hall that's closest to the Union, there's a quote that says, his famous quote about this, this war is not about slavery and freedom, it's about Union. And if I can save the Union by freeing all the slaves, I'll do that. If I can save the Union by freeing no, none of the slaves, I'll do that. That's where his politics lead at the beginning of the war. But then partway through the war, of course, as we all know, he becomes an emancipatory figure. Now, how did he get there? This is a painting that the great uh, artist Winslow Homer did during the end of the war and it came out and it was debuted in 1866 and it's actually a little painting it's about two feet by 18 inches or so it's in the Newark uh, Museum of Art but already looking back on the war from the vantage point of 1865 Homer is seeing where we might ground our hopes in looking at the history of the Civil War. So he, he does something very amazing, and I think it's only, it's only gotten more amazing as narratives of the Civil War have progressed. He takes this slave woman, the wonderful African head wrapping, and makes her the center of everything, makes her brain the center of everything in the drama of the Civil War. And the, the Painting is variously titled, I think um, that, ooh, maybe I can actually use this thing. Um, uh -huh. uh, I think that uh, Homer preferred captured liberators, and the reason that it carried that title is that up here, and in the little tiny original painting, it's even smaller and, and smudgier looking than this, is the drama of Yankee troops being captured by Confederate troops. So, you know, every movie about the Civil War, just about, every made-for-TV movie about the Civil War, that's, what the, that's the plot. And somehow they're brothers, and they all have different, they, they married each other's sisters, and, and they, they, uh, so that's, that's the story of the Civil War, the made-for-TV Civil War. And even at the time, it was the story of the Civil War. White sections fighting other white sections. But Homer says, no, the story of the Civil War is here. It's what happens at the cabin door. It's the near Andersonville title is that these uh, Yankee soldiers are being taken to this notorious Confederate uh, prison at Andersonville. But for Homer already, what's really decisive is what she's going to do. And what slaves do, W.B. Du Bois calls it the general strike of the slaves, by the hundreds and then by the thousands and then by the tens of thousands, ultimately more, is to find their way to the Union troops and to freedom. If you look on the Lincoln Heritage website, there's a line in it that says, at the beginning of the Civil War, no one thought that the war was about slavery and that slavery might end during the Civil War. No people 
thought that. Well, slaves thought that. And so they started to find their way to uh, Yankee generals who then said, at a time when Yankee war fortunes were poor, this might be a way to win this war. And they adopted Ben Butler, the first general to really think about this, adopted the term contraband to describe these slaves. And I've always thought, what a hideous thing. You know, he's, he's calling these slaves the property that seized in war and then turned over to the, uh, Victoria, to the people who are victorious in battle and they seize this property. It's contraband. The Freedmen's Camp in Caro in southern Illinois was called the Carroll Contraband Camp. But actually, Butler was on the side of exploiting this development and using it and making it work for, for, for freedom. And Lincoln for a long time wasn't. But in the context of uh, military uh, failures, in the context of what's now going to be a long, drawn-out war, and the inexorable pressure of more and more slaves finding their way to freedom and saying, look, we know you think this is a war to preserve union and, and possibly to preserve slavery. We think it's an emancipatory war. Lincoln then gets drawn into the possibility of doing this. Whatever else we can say about Lerone Bennett's uh, book uh, uh, about Lincoln, it, the title is Forced Into Glory, that title is wonderful. That title, and I sort of have a soft spot for the book too, but the, the title is, is what leadership is. The people who get to lead in a forceful, dramatic, transformative ways in politics are people who are forced to lead in those ways. And so it's, it's hundreds of thousands of these women and men at cabin doors who create the possibility for a link and, and create the possibility for a new world. Slaves, freed people, don't call Reconstruction, Reconstruction. Almost universally, they call Reconstruction Jubilee because they think the world is going to just keep changing. And if they look back to Leviticus in the Bible, how'd they know to do that? They look back to Leviticus in the, in the Bible and they say, not only is emancipation on the cards, but the Bible says that the land is going to go back and be redistributed and not going to be uh, owned in the way that it's, that it's uh, now owned. So they, they expected much more. They expected 40 acres and a mule. And they create these preconditions for a new world. So I think that in closing, that this again gives us some place to hope and some place to ground hope and some place to ground our own activities if we want to hope. You know, we can hope in leaders, but we can mainly hope in leaders who are pressured and people who are forced into glory and people who have mass movements uh, confronting them. Those are the political leaders uh, who have been able to do the most uh, in uh, U.S. history. But then there's also a little sobering caveat uh, to this, namely that race remained in this period a very structural matter. And when Jubilee didn't involve taking land away from slave owners and creating racial justice in terms of property as well as in terms of law, uh, constitutional amendments, it proved pretty easy to turn some of those great developments around and to failing to make the structural changes to not be able to preserve the legal changes uh, either. So I think um, we can talk about this. One of my uh, comments this morning, I spoke to a class that had read the book, and uh, one of the students said, well, you don't give us very many heroes to hope in, do you? <laughs> And, uh, you know, hope in her. Have that be your hero. And have that be where you fit into the, the picture of the world and, and how you uh, imagine changing the world. Um, start with, not with leaders, but with making it possible for leaders to make history. And what that, the people who are in charge of doing that are mass movements. Thanks.
So uh, I'll, I'm uh, fading fairly fast, but I'll take uh, three or four questions. And I'm told there's a microphone. Is that right? So, any questions? Yeah. Uh, this may be a very broad question. What is your opinion about the idea that the Civil War might have been a bad idea and that freedom would have evolved more effectively without it because some of the border states already plan to join the Union and then there may be some other aspects? Um, so the question is, is uh, was the Civil War misconceived or premature? Um, I, I don't really know how to address the what if of it. I mean, I think that, um, first of all, the South at that point had powerfully decided in favor of secession in many, uh, in many cases. Uh, and the war didn't then look like, it looked to the South, the South realized that it was fighting for slavery. Alexander Stevens says the Confederacy is the first social experiment firmly grounded on white, on white supremacy. And I think eventually that was gonna have trouble existing in the same union as the union that the Republicans uh, wanted uh, to exist in. Whether some kinds of compromise could have put that off for a while or, uh, or uh, changed matters in some way, I, I just don't know. I almost said I'm not a Lincoln expert, especially since Jim's here, but I'll just prove myself not a Lincoln expert in practice. <laughs> Others? Yeah. Okay, um, you spoke, you said that um, you know, since there was a beginning to white supremacy, there has to be an end. And in your book, you spoke of uh, Dr. Patterson, I believe, from Harvard University, and how he said mm -hmm. that um, racism was going to be over by 2050, and he had some very controversial statements. Um, I mean, if not 2050, or if not the reasons, uh, because of the reasons why he said, um, what do you see happening in order to get to that point? Well, I think that it's unlikely that race will disappear without wide structural disparities in resources. As long as uh, being white pays in this society and uh, there's a, a way to look at people of color and say there's more social misery in those communities, it must be something wrong with those communities. As long as those two things are out there, I think it's very unlikely that a three centuries old habit of thinking is going to just erode uh, because we're better educated or we get, uh, we get uh, better ideas uh, presented to us. So, I mean, in one way or another, I think addressing the problem of inequality and oppression is necessary to think our, about what a raceless world, uh, what a raceless uh, nation uh, might look like. The subprime mortgage crisis, I think, is a wonderful example of this because uh, it kind of is a thermometer of all of the social policies and uh, economic discrimination that has disadvantaged people of color in the housing market over decade after decade after decade. So why do people have to pursue these loans that in many cases are destined to crash? Well, they're coming late after decades of being shut out of both neighborhoods and housing markets and loans. And not because of conservatives, but because of liberals. The New Deal creates redlining in the United States and, and the Fair Deal expands the uh, racial directing of loan uh, to suburbs and away from, from cities. So you get this situation in which the, the uh, subprime mortgage crisis registers all this history of, of white supremacy in housing. Not too unpredictably, 
the subprime loans are, whole, are held four times out of proportion uh, by uh, black and Latino borrowers as opposed to white borrowers. When these foreclosures happen, it'll be the largest transfer of wealth away from black people in the history of the, of the United States. And yet, we really haven't been able to talk about that in public. Even though some people are saying, well, that brought the whole economy down. So it would seem like it's a, it's a very, very urgent matter to talk about and to be honest about and to be honest about the history that, that goes into it. And in the context of the election, I think it was clear that Obama couldn't talk about it in that way. It would have hurt. I mean, any advisor would have told him that's not a great issue to, to raise. But at some point, we have to talk about it in that way. Because as I suggested earlier, the right is talking about it in that way and is trying to, to make the subprime crisis into a, a, a matter of irresponsible borrowing by people of color. So I think, you know, that, that the harder facts of achieving economic justice, the harder to build a political coalition around facts, have to be a part of what we do to make it possible for Obama to lead. People have to have those conversations, even if it's not too possible to have them on Fox News or MSNBC, or we have to have them with each other. Other questions? There's one here. Thank you very much for thank the presentation. You. Uh, you focused on the U.S., and thank you for that. I wanted to know if you could just speak just about the international race issue. What words of wisdom, thoughts, analysis, or um, yeah, thoughts that you might have, given that you're speaking about the U U U.S. and Many people have been looking at the U.S. as this place of power, and yet we have these different so-called races all over the world. I would just love to hear your thoughts. Yeah. Yeah, yeah in a week when uh, it looks like the African Union might become a reality in a different way, it's an a important week. Um, I think that one of the things that's going to happen with these uh, bailouts of the very rich is that it's going to make it easier to appeal to the idea that there are, there's such a thing as an American job. That there's, there was just a big strike wave in Britain, uh, wildcat strike wave, that was around the idea that uh, foreign workers were taking British jobs. And so the slogan of part of the strikes was British jobs for, for British workers. Now the, the, the foreigners in this case were Italians. And they, they were exercising their EU rights to move about in Europe. But I think that more and more of uh, the bailouts are going to redouble anti-immigrant racism in not just in the United States, but in all of the different places, because it seems like it's the nation that's bailing out the corporation. And then, you know, people are going to say, well, then why does GM, we well, just bailed GM out. Why are they then building this factory in Mexico? Fair enough. But then they're also going to say, why do immigrant workers have the right to jobs at a Toledo Jeep plant after Toledo has signed away its future in order to keep that Jeep plant. So I, I think that, again, these things that are likely to drive race in the next 20 years are very deep structural matters that, you know, we, we can't really talk about them in terms of good and bad racial attitudes just. When people are saying British jobs for British workers, they're not saying I'm an intolerant person or they're, you know, they're making an economic uh, argument. And so I think more and more in the whole world, we have to try to, to, to figure out how to not get working people to be moving a race toward the bottom of standards and, and uh, life faster and faster along because more and more, and I, I, I want to just give a, a U.S. example, but that goes to the, to the world of a way that, that doing this book made me think that we haven't transcended this world. Uh, Ken's here, Farinac I think is not here, but uh, there's a meatpacking 
town called Beardstown that's close to here in, along the Illinois River, I guess. Um, and it used to have big union meat packing with local workers who were white, mostly, uh, having the union uh, jobs. The unions got smashed. The plants came back in a smaller variety as non-union plants. And the workers there are divided and consciously divided. You see this in Iowa in one place after another, too. Along national, religious, who's legal and who's not uh, legal lines. So you have in Beardstown, which is this sleepy, tiny town of 2,000 people, you have appreciable numbers of Congolese workers who are legal, who are being pitted against Mexican and Central American workers who are seen as, and sometimes probably are, without documentation. You have people being recruited by labor contractors who are born-again Christians who are saying, you have to prove to the boss that Guatemalan born-again Christians are better than Congolese workers. And if you get on the wrong side of that, those Congolese workers uh, in some cases, get on the wrong side of their, they won the lottery, the immigration lottery, they're legal immigrants to the United States, so-called. They're in this tiny, cold place, moved from the Congo. They get on the wrong side of the bus, and then they get shipped to salmon processing ships off of Alaska. So anybody who thinks that race is just going to be worked out at some street corner in the United States, even in sleepy Beardstown, it's all of this transnational process that, and you know, those Congolese workers bring ideas about race with them. Mexican workers bring ideas about race or bring ideas about black popular culture with them. So it really is, even in the United States, the kind of racialized world impinges on everything that, that, that we do. I think we should stop, unless, oh, okay, Ken, go ahead. Yeah. Now, sorry, the question about ground, grounding hope, just in terms of the sites of struggle. So clearly, of course, the plantation was an important space for mm -hmm. organizing. And then, of course, the factory. But your reflections on the urban ghetto, the barrio, the barrio, as sites of anti racist resistance where people are now coming together in different forms. Do you see that? I think uh, communities, and particularly as uh, Grace Lee says sometimes communities that are having to reinvent themselves out of nothing that are kind of thrown on their own resources to, to plan, communities that are poisoned, communities that uh, uh, have nothing but their self-activity uh, to rely on, I think that those are sites of, of hope. I also still think workplaces are, are very, very important uh, sites of hope uh, as well and in a, in a way that sometimes is a little bit uh, minimized. But uh, thanks for your question. We should stop, or I should stop. Thanks. Okay.